We already watched the the first video of this. Necrit went and he he uh, I guess talked about the lore of League of Legends and and how basically like the the Riot MMO already has like the framework in place for um, for having the, the the world established right. Very similar to what World of Warcraft had with uh, coming off of the Warcraft games. He's made a second video uh, actually a few days ago, and um, we'll link that in the description and. Uh, we'll talk about this. He's going to talk about potential races and classes of Riot's MMO according to the lore. And uh, some people talked about like the faction stuff. We, we talked a little bit about like the, the, the faction system. My initial thoughts on this is that I, I do think it makes sense to have either more than two factions, like having, having a, like a three faction system or something in place. Um, but also I do think there's a world where you actually don't have factions at all. Let's just watch the video, and I'll, I'll talk more about this at the end. Well, I'm back. Last time we had a look at the world of Riot's MMO, and we talked about how the overall world design has been done for a few years now. If you have no idea what League's universe is about, I would recommend watching that one first. But now that we learned about the basics, we can dive into the other big MMO topic, the playable races and classes. When it comes to the races, just like the world, they are pretty much done. Over the years, the lore fleshed out the races of Runeterra, and now they each have their own unique story. In fact, at this point, it feels like we know Riot will not make up a brand new race. Of course, they could always theoretically do it, but I seriously doubt they would. I, I feel like I feel like that would be like forcing a new race into the world of Lord of the Rings. It would feel off among all the already established rules. I strongly doubt you want to put a bunny person next to Aragorn. Wait. You'd be surprised. Um, and I think I think a big part of uh, what you have here is like when whenever you're making an MMO based off of like a currently established like world. Um, I think that them adding new races and stuff in it's it's something that they just don't need to do. Like that, like it's not even like uh oh it doesn't make sense like there's there's no there's no need to even think about it because there's already so many different types of characters and and types of uh, champions in league that could be different races or even different classes. So, in fact, the reason why I'm so interested in this video in the first place is what races would even be playable, what classes would even be playable because like what really constitutes like because when you have classes you have character like archetypes right like you have like the mage. Right, the wizard, mage, whatever, um, and you have different types of like wizard classes, right? Like, let's take WoW for instance, and you have like warlocks, you have uh, you have mages, you have um, um, oh, evoker. That's the new one. I was like, why? Why is my why is my brain drawn a blank on the new one? Evoker, right? So evoker is like a new new mage class, and then there's also like the hybrids, like the priest can can be a mage, uh, the shaman can be a mage so on, right? You have like these different things, uh, these different champions in League of Legends and, and like, if you have like, let's say a paladin, what is a paladin? Like is Leona a paladin? Is, is Tarek a paladin? Is Garen a paladin? Is Kale a paladin? Like what, what, like what's the difference between a paladin and a warrior and how it really fits in? Uh, you could say like the, the like crusader, holy warrior type of like character archetype. Uh, like what would that be? With that said, don't worry, because the lore will allow Riot to make up new races and make them feel natural. I'll show you their clever system in just a moment. But for now, just know that yes, we already know the races of this world. So the question is not going to be what races Riot is going to make up. The question is going to be, from the races that already exist, which ones will be playable? And perhaps more importantly, how will they be playable? You see, a few years back, I released a similar video where we talked about the classes and the races together with TB Skyen. And today, I would not recommend you watch that video. Back then, I was still clinging onto the idea that faction-based MMOs were a good idea. It worked for WoW and it worked for my guilty pleasure, Wildstar. Unfortunately, what I didn't know is that merely a year later, the idea of faction-based MMOs would crumble to dust. That's because factions have a massive flaw. Besides the fact that PvP is almost guaranteed to be one-sided. I mean, who would want to play for the losing side? Especially if there is no compensation. Classic WoW is a perfect proof of that. 
Not to mention New World. But also, if you split everyone into two sides, um. you are splitting up your player base. And that is almost never a good idea. You simply don't want to prevent people from playing together. The reason why... I think I think speaking in absolutes about this is is kind of... Um, I think I think faction-based faction, faction -based MMOs do work. And they, they have worked for many years. I do think... I think saying like 100% blanket like it doesn't work, it's, it's very... Um, it's 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 kind of close minded. I think it's close minded because if you really like take the experience of what a a well actually hold on there's two parts to this now because I, I just thought of something else. I think if you take the experience of what MMOs have been over the years and, and uh, a big part of uh, having like multiple factions and and I always use Dark Age of Camelot as an example because that's what I played before World of Warcraft. So, so the proof is in the pudding, and you've had success there, and, and the systems in the game have to have to work around having those multiple factions, uh, like, work properly. Um, when you want to take Dark Age of Camelot, for example, Dark Age of Camelot had, had a three-faction system, and, I mean, there were definitely servers where, where one faction just, like, ran, just ran the table with a frontier region, and, and they just owned. Uh, there, that definitely happened. But in my experience, you always had like a power shift going from from one faction to another, uh, where you'd have these relic raids, and and the relics would always switch, and darkness falls like would would always kind of switch. Um, I played on uh, Percival, I played on Merlin, and uh, those are the two primary servers that I played on in Dark Age of Camelot, and uh, I always remember there was definitely like I think Alb Percival was really good. Um, in Merlin, Merlin, I remember it like rotating. I remember Midgard, Hibernia, and Albion all being good at different times. Um, Alb Lancelot, I remember, was really good. But uh, anyway, so so I'm, I'm kind of like reminiscing. But um, I think it I think it's fine. It's just the systems in the game have to have to allow for that, and also like the the developers of the game, the company has to monitor it. So he used Classic WoW as an example of of. Uh, you know, the splitting up the player base and people don't want to play on the losing side. And uh, I think he's right about that. But I also think that same classic WoW example goes to show there's a lot of people who feel like their their experience in the game has been diminished from playing on a, on a one-sided faction. I love playing on Alliance Benediction. I love playing on Alliance Benediction because there's 30,000 people playing and uh, it's crazy. There's 30,000 people raiding every week. It's crazy easy to, to find groups and to get stuff happening and to do stuff. But... That's from like the PVE perspective. The world does absolutely feel less alive in, in Burning Crusade on, on Benediction um, from the perspective of having an opposing faction and running around in the world and world PvP and that kind of stuff. I like that stuff. That is something that is not popular. A lot of the things that I like in MMOs and a lot of the things that I like in, in WoW, particularly Classic WoW, unfortunately are not very popular. Like the, the, uh, the average player wants to have the path of least resistance to everything that they do. And that is just life. That is how it works. That, I mean, even in real life, that's how it works. Um, so for me, I do like some of that stuff, but I also like having like a, a living, breathing world where I can go out and there's like a sense of danger out in the wilderness of, of you know, I can get ganked. Um, that's why there's, there are some like balanced faction servers like Grobulus, right? Grobulus is still there. Um, I think the, the fresh server launch is going to have a very similar experience at first. Maybe eventually it'll snowball one way or the other. But that's why I'm excited for the fresh server launch coming on August 30th. I think that will be really good content. World PvP and leveling and all that stuff. Uh, I think it's going to be uh, fantastic. Now, the reason why in Classic WoW it snowballed out of control, uh, honestly, it's because Blizzard's lazy as shit. Blizzard should have put caps... On, they should have stopped transfers whenever the factions started getting too far unbalanced. Instead of just being like, okay, thanks for the money. They're lazy. And they did not monitor it. And back in the day, they did. If you guys remember, they used to have faction, or sorry, uh, server transfers. Even back in vanilla, they had server transfers. But they were monitored. And only specific servers could transfer to other specific servers. It was, it was very closely monitored. And in Classic WoW, it was not. And that is why you had the snowball effect of uh, this graph that he showed, right? Grobulus is still pretty balanced. That's sick. You know, that's good. But then you have a lot of this, right? And you have name drop here. So, <laughs> I don't know. It just looked like name drop. 
Um, yeah, this is an issue, right? I think a, I think a multiple faction system does work in in uh, games, but it has to be very closely monitored. And I think that the potential of gameplay that comes out of it, like the systems in the game, have to be balanced around it and have to be have to work around it. You know what I mean? So. That's where Riot has the edge. You may know that League of Legends has a lot of different regions, where they all act independently and they all have unique relationships with their neighbors. Because of this, forcing faction alliances into this world would ruin the already established lore. So PvP factions are most likely not going to be a thing. However, despite that, League absolutely has faction pride. People love it when a new Shuriman champion is announced, because people love that place. And people love it when the new champion is not Ionian, because goddamn we have too many Ionians. Nearly every League of Legends player has a favorite region. And you bet when the MMO comes out, people will want to play for that region. And this is where the brilliance of Riot's world kicks in. Okay. You see, the fundamental lore of League of Legends is based around the idea that anyone can be from any region. After an event the story refers to as the Westward Migration, races mixed up all around the world. So it's not like there is a furry region where you can only see furries. There are definitely regions where you can see more furries, but this world doesn't have exclusives. This means that when you're picking up what you want to play, Besides just picking a race and a class combination, I strongly suggest Riot also allows people to pick their origin, with the origin being the starting region. Without a system like this, you would force all human champions to be, for example, Noxian. And that is simply not how this world works. Yeah. So, I've been mambling about how this world works for quite a while. So now, let's actually dive into all the races that exist in this universe. Spoiler alert, League doesn't have too many different races, because it's focusing on depth over variety. Of course, as it is with any RPG, there is the human race. But it would be cool if the humans varied depending on their origins. For example, if you pick a human from the Freljord, they would be an Iceborne and they would have extra frost resistance. A Demacian could have a bit more magic resistance, Ionians could have a bit more nature resistance, Shuriman's heat resistance, and so on. I think it's going to be crucial for Riot to preserve the feeling of every origin feeling at least slightly different. This is an RPG after all, and despite the fact that balancing is usually a big issue, I strongly believe these RPG elements have to be preserved. But if Riot is afraid of people min-maxing the game from the very beginning, focusing on the origin stat with the most value, Riot can always do the safe thing and only give each origin different customization. These are things that I don't like. That is, that is a very like new age MMO line of thinking. And people always talk about like, oh, well, gaming is different now. Gaming is different now. People are doing this now. People are doing that now. Well, there's a number of reasons for this. But I'll tell you this much. Why are MMOs... MMOs are... are, are as unpopular as they've ever been. They're the least popular they've been as far as, like, ha having an active player base. Like, if you're looking at, like, the percentage of things. Maybe it's because the way that they think about these MMOs and the design of these MMOs is kind of shitty. Now, I, I do think that you have to account for the times. I'm very, I'm very, like, I I'm actually very strongly opinioned about that. I I've said it since before Classic WoW launched. You got to account for the times. You got to do some things different. You got to get it figured out, right, to, to account for some things. Yes, players are going to min-max. They are always going to try and min-max the game. And that's fun for a lot of people. That is, I think when people say, oh, people min-max the fun out of everything. Why are they always min-maxing this? Why are they always trying so hard that? Well, you know what? That's fun for them. Just because you or I or somebody else wants to play the game the way that we want to play it doesn't mean that they can't have fun the way that they want to play it. Now, the, the, proper, the proper way to design the game is to allow people to play the game the way that they want to 
but allow them to to find other players who will play the game the same way that they want to play it in order for them to, to do the things that they want to do. So I do think, oh, just let them pick their racials. Oh, just let them pick all their stuff at the beginning. That's boring. You need RPG elements in the game. Like, it is, it is cool, it is immersive to have, like, um, you know... N- I'm just, this is kind of like, this isn't like a strong example, but let's say like gnomes have a bonus engineering stat. It doesn't really do anything. It, it like in the grand scheme of things, it doesn't really do anything that gnomes have a, have bonus to their engineering stat. So it's not really a strong example, but having things like that in the game are really, really good. You need RPG mechanics. You need RPG elements in the game. And World of Warcraft is, is, always going to be the gold standard that historically right when you look at a game that that blew every other game out of the water an mmo that blew every other mmo out of the water whenever it came out and it made mmos mainstream period when you look at vanilla to burning crusade to wrath of the lich king there was it was second to none it was unreal right that's just the truth right the 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 proof is in the pudding but a lot of the things that worked in that game or in the game back then don't necessarily work the exact same way now. That is why you need to make changes to account for the times. So when we look back on this, if you look if you look historically, what was the turning point in WoW? A lot of people will say Cataclysm. A lot of people will say, I think a lot of people will say Cataclysm. I think some people will say Mists of Pandaria, and I think some people will say Wrath of the Lich King. I think Wrath of the Lich King was the beginning of the end. I'm one of those people. Beginning of the end. It's kind of dramatic. But, but that's what, that was whenever the turning point was. And uh, there were a number of things inside of Wrath of the Lich King that were really bad, right? Community, community made things, like gear score, like uh, achievements. For example, uh, achievements are going to be fun. They're going to they're gonna have some cool things attached to them. But the, the emphasis on, on needing achievements to do content was really bad, in my opinion. Like, I, I quit at the beginning of Wrath, came back at the end, literally couldn't get a group for anything, and I quit again. But specifically, I'm going to talk about not just things in the game, but I'm going to talk about a mentality shift. A mentality shift that occurred back then was, and, and you saw it from the beginning of Vanilla WoW, slowly all the way into Wrath of the Lich King, and then there was a Big hit. The jumping point from Wrath to Cataclysm was whenever they went and they noticed World of Warcraft went from being an RPG to an eSport. Whenever MLG was popping off, people were watching Wrath of Lich King arenas. It was crazy. It was super hype. It was super exciting. So... Whenever, the, like, Blizzard came to a realization, it was like, wait, WoW is an eSport now. So when WoW became an eSport, they stopped worrying as much about RPG elements. They stopped worrying about the immersion. They stopped worrying as much about, well, it makes sense for this class to be like this, or it makes sense for this race to be like this, because that's what they are. It's role play, And it started being more about balance. And then the big hit was whenever they completely trashed the old system, of, of class design. Kevin Jordan, the original class designer, was gone. They brought in another guy, and they said, you no longer play the class, you play a spec. You play a, a ret paladin, Yo. you are labeled as a DPS. You play a prop paladin, you are labeled as a tank. You play a holy paladin, you are labeled as a healer. And then they balanced the entire game and the skills and everything that that class had into what that spec now has, and it completely changed how the class played. I don't play a paladin anymore in Wrath, in, sorry, excuse me, in Cataclysm. I play a retribution paladin. And and how like I will have certain spells that no longer exist. I will have like it, it just completely changes how the game works. And why did they do this? Because in their eyes, it is easier to balance. All the DPS can do this. Well, every DPS has a kick. Did everybody have a kick in Cataclysm? But it's it's almost everyone at least had had some sort of an interrupt had some sort of a uh damage boost 
had some sort like everybody has a wall now. Everybody has this. Everybody has self healing. Everybody has. And, and what they were trying to do is they were trying to hyper balance the game. But the truth is, is that balance is boring. When when you go in and have a hundred percent min max to a T of balance, you don't have that flavor and you don't have that parity in the game that makes the game good. One thing that we've noticed in Burning Crusade Classic, for example, going back and playing the game 15 years later, is I feel like 3v3 is not nearly as balanced as uh, what people thought it was back then, and I think 5v5 is incredibly balanced. Or mostly balanced. I think I think 5v5 balance is, is much better than people remember it being, and I think 3v3 is not as balanced as people remember it being. Um, for example, looking at arenas. So I'm very curious to see how Wrath of the Lich King is going to play out. I kind of went off on a rant here. But my point being with all this is, I have two points. Um, one is, if you start moving away from what an R MMORPG is, and you start focusing more on, uh, and, and over, like you overly focus on balance versus having immersion and RPG elements and stuff in the game, then you're gonna hurt it because people are going to find a way to min-max the game to the nth degree regardless. So I think what you need to do is take those RPG elements and stuff and design them and put them in a game in such a way that players can min-max. Because min-maxers, they don't care about the final number. What they care about is being the best. They care about the ranking. They don't care about the number. You see what I'm saying? So yeah, you could do all this stuff and you can get a really high number, but it, it, they want to be number one. So if, if you're number one and you're, let's say you do 100 DPS, I'm just using easy numbers, or you're number one and you're doing 2,000 DPS, it's the same thing because at the end of the day, you're, you're that much farther ahead than everything, right? Project Honor sneak peek. This is not a Project Honor sneak peek. This is just my own sort of like, how, how, this is my own opinion, okay? This has nothing to do with Notorious Studios, okay? Um, but... The, the way that I see this personally is uh, that, that you need to put these RPG elements and stuff in the game. Let min-maxers min-max however they want to min-max. Just let them do it, but have the RPG elements and stuff in the game in a way that you almost can't min-max it too hard. So you let them be number one, but you don't let number one be like leagues above everybody else. Like... Like number the difference between number one and number like a hundred should be there, but it shouldn't be like oh like what's the point of even playing if I'm not min maxing? Typical wild player thing I max numbers instead of fun. No, no, but that's the thing that is fun for them, for for those types of players. So what I'm saying is you have to design the way in a game, or you got to design the game in a way that uh, allows you to basically um, let you have both. By you can min max and you can be number one and you can push it as hard as you can, but you don't push it to a point where you're like in a whole nother galaxy. And if you don't try and min max, then you, you might as well not play. That is a bad, that is bad. So you've got to find the balance. And a lot of that is by putting these RPG elements in the right way in the class design, the race design, all that stuff. Okay, continue. In the Freljord, people tend to be more pale with lush beards and Nordic tattoos all over their bodies. Shuriemans have the classic dreadlock style. People from Bilgewater have the pirate crew tattoos. Piltovans are your fancy mustache people, and Ionians have the wild, untamed hair and beards. So even yeah, almost like a sprinter. That's a good example. Stats, I do believe these unique character customizations would. We're, yes, we're playing Madden later today. Too. Madden later today. So that's what humans would be about. Pretty versatile and nothing too special in an RPG world. So now let's have a look at the more unique races. After humans, the second most spread out race are the Vastaya. As we mentioned in the last video, the Vastaya are a race that came to be after humans started mating with magical animals. But the <gasps> thing is, depending Furries? on where they are from, there are loads of different kinds of Vastaya. From cat boys to fox girls to lizard girls. In fact, here's a family tree of all the Vastayan tribes, and even this doesn't cover all of them. And this is where Riot can pull off something genius. As I said, this world already has set rules. So it would be very difficult to introduce a brand new race into this universe. However, it is going to be very easy to just make up a new Vastayan tribe. 
So I propose that Riot doesn't make the Vastaya as a playable race overall, but instead it would be cool if Riot let the specific tribes to be playable races. This would leave the door open for them to introduce new playable races later down the line. If they cross off all the Vastaya at once, they kinda shoot themselves in the foot. But I know, I know, here I go mumbling about how the world works again. So let's have a look at some of the specific tribes. When I say Vastaya, most people think of Ari. She comes from the Vasani that look like foxes. Although her tribe is mostly gone, the lore can justify new members to be found, so they can be playable. The Kilash tribe comes from the jungles between Shurima and Ishtal. These lion-like people are known for hunting dangerous beasts, and they take great pride in trophy collecting. It's the average mount collector. The Shimon tribe are monkey-like people from Ionia. While their older members are very wise, their younger members can be very goofy. The Otrani come from Mount Targon, resembling the classic goat people. If their you had the same passion for politics, you'd be president. Of Thanks, the, <laughs> the Lothland <laughs> tribe are Ionians who resemble bird people. This tribe likes to combine the art of dancing with lethal assassinations. The Uvikat are something close to lizards, though they do have the ability to shapeshift. Out of all of the other tribes, these are the closest to their pure blood ancestors. Now, these were the more pure blood tribes, but there are many, many more Vastaya yeah, who parody don't is entertaining, any exactly. of these. For example, Set has an Ionian Vastayan mother and a Noxian human father, so he doesn't really have a tribe. Long story moves short, in stereo. Thank you for the 21 months. Thank you, moves in stereo. I didn't hear that earlier. And Riot can use them in a million different ways. This is where they can really go wild. But that's it for the Vastaya. So now, let's have a look at the third most popular race. The Yordles. These are the classic RPG tiny people. In League of Legends, people either adore them or hate them. There is no... Did I think this up earlier? No, you did 10 months like earlier, didn't you, Nicholas? But not I think you guys. missed it. Everyone hates I them. think you missed me. There Sorry. is no doubt in my mind that Yordles will be playable. Even though they have an interesting catch. You see, unlike all the other races on Runeterra, Yordles are immortal. They are essentially modes of annoying. magic that come from a hidden magical realm known as Vandal City. And because they are made of magical essence, when they die, we don't really know what happens. But we assume they return to the Bandle City and there they respawn. With that said, the lore suggests that maybe Yordles can die, but they just can't die of old age. But let's ignore that, that's a massive rabbit hole. So, you know, when it comes to gameplay, at least corpse running is going to make sense for them. Now, because Yordles I did miss Taint Flickers 49 months though, cases, and Waka for Wars one year, thank you guys. Cheerful. Even their home realm is very colorful because of that. Guys, but then, okay, guys, I'm not playing a Yordle. Stop asking me to play a Yordle. There is also Vex, a Yordle champion who has human. recently been added into League of Legends, who gives Yordles an interesting perspective. You see, unlike all the other Yordles, the hell, who's Vex this? hates living. She hates the bright colors and the cheerfulness. You know, <laughs> it's the average League player. So Vex <laughs> yeah. is constantly in deep depression and agony. All she wishes for is to leave this world, but she can't, because Yordles can't die. Anyway, just like all the other races, Yordles can be found all around Runeterra. There is Poppy in Demacia, Clet in Noxus, Kennen in Ionia, Rumble in Shurima, and so on. But now, so far we have only covered the races which I'm pretty sure will launch with the MMO. The humans, the Vastaya and the Yordles are the core of this world. So now we are diving into the races that still exist in this universe. But it's going to be up to Riot if they make them playable. First of all, there are the Minotaurs. The Minotaurs are different from the Vastaya because they don't have magical ancestors. Alistar. They are just a standalone race. Originally, the Minotaurs controlled the mountains south of Noxus. But because Noxus is Noxus, soon they absorb the Minotaurs into their empire. With that said, some Minotaurs fled the tyranny of Noxus and they joined the other regions. A great example is Kryl, the Minotaur fighting in the elite armies of Demacia. 
And yes, the Minotaurs also have the stereotypical sexy female version in this universe, so they can easily be turned into a playable race. Next, in Bilgewater, there is an incredible amount of weird fishy people. A lot of these could be really cool playable races when Bilgewater gets its expansion. Although modeling helmets for a hammerhead shark is going to be interesting. We also can't forget about the trolls. Previously I showed you the ice trolls, but there are also the sand trolls. And here's an interesting fact for League veterans. We have never seen a sand troll, but because of Ezreal's adventures, we know they exist. They should be around Ikathia, which you belong in a museum. is where Jax is from, who also has three fingers, by the way. So it is extremely likely that the Wait, mysterious... what? I didn't know Jax had three fingers. Did you guys know this? So what is Jax? Jax is a, Jax, Jax is a, tr is a sand troll? I thought Jax was a human. Yes, Jax is a ninja turtle? Is a sand troll. Regardless, the majority of trolls are united oh. under Trundle, the self-proclaimed Troll King, who is fighting in the service of Lysandra, who is a baddie even though she is morally right. So since the majority of the trolls are <laughs> he enemies, her I doubt they will be a playable race. <laughs> Lastly, let's not forget that this universe also has yetis. <sighs> Fun fact, before everything got frozen, the yeti civilization was very advanced. They even had their own technology based around She a magic. baddie, bro. In fact, Willem, the yeti Nunu is riding on, is a hologram from the yeti technology. But then, as the civilization disappeared, the yetis went a bit more ferocious. So no, they won't be playable either. But that's pretty much it for the races. As I'm- Esfan, can I come out? I don't want to scrub the floors anymore. Did you finish scrubbing the cabinets? mentioned there aren't too many different kinds, but that's because Riot is avoiding mimicking other RPGs. That's why there are no dwarves or elves here. Runeterra is simply trying to be unique in every way, and so far, it is working. Now, I also have seen some people asking if Darkin will be playable, to which I have to say, that's like asking if you can play as a god. The Darkin are a corrupted version of the Ascended God Warriors. A single Darkin can annihilate an army of a thousand. In fact, the Darkin known as Aatrox is the only being in existence that managed to kill a celestial god. He stabbed someone wielding the power of the Aspect of War so hard, the Aspect of War died. <coughs> so no, I don't think Darkin will be playable. Anyway, with all the races covered, assuming Riot is going to use the origin system, this is what the playable races could look like. Humans are versatile, they are everywhere. No one scrubs ca cabinets? When it comes to the Vastaya, the common tribes can easily appear in Noxus, Piltover and Bilgewater. These are the regions open to everyone. On the other side, the Vastaya are closely linked to spiritual magic. So you will hardly find one in Demacia, since it is a firmly anti Six year region. early speculation. And somehow not many Vastaya were ever mentioned in the Freljord, so Riot doesn't have to force them there. But then we have Shurima, Ionia and Targon. Assuming these would be saved for expansions, they could be used to introduce new playable races. Since I doubt all the newcomers remember the names, the Kilash, Lothlan and Otrani are the lion people, bird people and goat people. When it comes to the Yordles, as I mentioned, they can originate from anywhere, but they do avoid the Freljord and Targon because of the harsh climates. And yes, I know, there were some prehistoric Yordles in the Freljord, but after it got covered in ice, they disappeared. And lastly, the Minotaurs can be found in Demacia and Noxus. But it does make sense for some of them to flee to the Freljord, and others to travel to Ionia during the invasion. With all of this said, remember, this is just my decently educated opinion. Since the races are pretty much mixed up all over Runeterra, Riot could also lift the limitations and let every race start in every region. And I would be fine with that. Some story would be wonky. See, I think that's weird. I, like, I, don't, I don't like... I don't like the idea of just any race being able to start anywhere or like in, in like a centralized location or something. Um, 
I think it is it is generally good for the game and and for the especially for the new player experience when you create a a character of a certain race that you start in like that that race is like hometown. And I want to give two examples here. Um, and, and I want to also give a counter argument to what I'm saying. So, uh, two examples. One is, uh, let's use World of Warcraft. I actually recently made an alt. I made a druid and I'm leveling a druid. And I like the human starting area. I made a new character and I've, and I've been leveling this druid. The, the, the point of what I'm saying is I think it's good to be able to, to play a game and uh, you start out and you're like in Darnassus area, you're in Teldrassil or whatever. And um, like, it's good. Like this is, this is the environment that I should be in whenever, whenever I'm playing. It's good for RP. It, it spreads players out across the whole world, right? That is something that is important is spreading players out across the entirety of the world. And kind of, kind of, instead of putting all the population in at one place at a choke point, they, they, cause they're inevitably, again, talking about the min maxing thing, there is inevitably going to be a situation where you are, where there is going to be a best place to level. Right? So you guys are saying Dornas is worst starting area. Some of you guys. That's really the counter argument to what I have to say. Is there is, there is going to be a place where people feel like is the best place to level. Talking about the alliance side, some people like the human area, some people like the dwarf and gnome area. So... Naturally, what happens is if you give is if you give people the option to do that, they will do that. Like that's how I feel, because I'm like I, I want to make a night elf druid, but I was like, man, I want to go level in Elwyn Forest, but I ended up leveling here. And when you're talking about the the uh, for two things, when you're talking about like the um, the population spread, like the 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 geography of the the world, and and like when you're talking about world design and how you want to put players in, you have this living, breathing world, this MMO. Um, if you put everybody in at one place, now you've got like a choke point of there's too many people doing the same quests. There's, uh, there, there's too many people in, in a certain city. There's other parts of the game that aren't being looked at. There's, there's other content that you want people to spread out throughout the entirety of the world and you want to bleed into each other. And that goes, especially if you have two factions, like let's talk about WoW again. Night elves are in, in Teldrassil, they come down into Ashenvale, they, they've got this whole area here that actually connects to where a lot of the Horde population is, right? Ashenvale connects to, uh, is it the Barrens or um, Duratar that it connects to? Either, either way, it, it comes in and it connects to, to the Horde area because it's very close to Ogremar. So when this area comes in and connects, you have a whole like lore RP, that's where Warsong Gulch occurs, right? That's where Warsong Gulch occurs, the battle of, like, the orcs and the night elves. Uh, it's a whole battleground. You have this cross-faction gameplay that occurs of uh, the, the Horde players doing world PvP with the Alliance players at that point. So you want to have this spread throughout the whole thing. The, the, the counter-argument to that is I like the Alliance, I like the human area the most. So I, I wish that I could start a night elf in the human area and just do the human quests. But I know... From from like my ha, looking at the the game through the lens of like a design perspective, I know that's bad for the game, and sometimes you just have to look at things that way and be like, yeah, that's bad. Uh, and and why is it bad for the game, and why do I know this kind of stuff happens? Is if you look at Dark Age of Camelot, this is this this is the last example I want to use. If you look at Dark Age of Camelot, what they did eventually in that game is you went from having a like let's say you played Hibernia. The Celts or the Celts or whatever would start in Connacht. Is that right? They would start they would start in like Shannon Estuary and, and they were in Connacht and that was like a whole area that was like very like, you know, Irish, Scottish sort of you know, that, that was it. That was like cool. I think you would have like the Lurikeens start in Magmel, is that right? I think the Lurikeens and the Elves started in Magmel. Um, but but you would have like which was like more of like a magical area outside of Tirnanog. So then you would have all these guys throughout the world come and, and, and they'd eventually meet up by doing quests and the quest would lead you to certain areas to lead you to the capital city of Tirnanog. Um, to, to, you, you'd see different dungeons and different areas and, and places in the world that you could go through that, um, through, through playing the game that way. Now, what happened eventually is as that game got older and it got more and more optimized, the problem is, is they, they said, okay, well, instead of putting people out where they should be based on roleplay... And story, let's put people all in a tutorial area. 
So then they put everybody in a tutorial. Every new character goes to a tutorial area. And then that tutorial area just spits them out right outside of Magmel, which is right next to the capital city. Because it's like, oh, we'll just put new character, new whatever, and we'll just put them there. And, and I think the idea became that maybe there's not a whole lot of new players playing that game. So the only people making new characters are people that already play the game, so they don't want to go through the whole dog and pony show of like getting to the capital city or whatever. But that is something that is really not good for the development of the game. Retail has this now too. Yeah, these are these are not good. These are not good things. I think WoW definitely shouldn't do it because there's definitely there's still new people playing. Dark Age of Camelot is is like twenty years old and and it, it is it is in the old generation of MMOs. So yeah, that's that's why I think that it's not good to to allow players creating a new character to pick their starting zone because inevitably there's going to be a and again talking about min max versus RP and finding a balance. The min-maxers will all go to the best starting zone and it's going to hurt the, the population spread in the world and, and just how the world develops and expands. Um, I think that is bad. I think players should, should whatever their race is, whatever their selection is, end up in a certain area, start in a certain area. Anything horrible. Although I still believe some racial exclusivity helps the feeling of RPGs. So all of this is still only the first half of the video. If you want to take a break and do your business without washing your hands, now's your chance. This program will continue in five seconds. Did you wash your hands? Okay, so far we only covered the races, which was definitely still the easy part. The much, much, much more difficult part are going to be the classes. This is where Riot is facing a great challenge. Iron Canaway. It's because mm. there are inherently no wrong answers when it comes to designing a class system. You can really make anything work if you put some thought into it. But more than that, Riot is challenged by the setting itself. League of Legends currently has over 160 different champions. They each have unique abilities, and together they can define about 40 different classes. Yeah, I, I, I actually think that's a big myself. obstacle. From that right there is a massive obstacle for this game. For, for Riot's MMO, it, that's a, that I, personally, I find that to be a huge obstacle. What classes do you pick? And that's what I talked about earlier whenever I was talking about wizards, right? Like in, in Dark Age of Camelot, you have, like, you have the, the enchanters, you have an eldritch, you have uh, wizards, you have thurgists, you have... Um, uh, mentalists, you have shamans, you have, like, there's just so many different things, right? And together, they can define about 40 different classes. I counted them myself. From these, Sorcerers, yeah, to everything. only a handful to be playable. Which means the majority of the classes won't make it in. And people who love those classes will be disappointed. Thankfully, I'm not a designer, so instead of trying to figure out how to make this work, it's I'm a going huge to show obstacle. You all the cool, unique classes this universe has. And again, because region pride is a big part of this universe, you'll see that some of these are tied to specific regions. But not the warrior. That one is different in every single region. So let's start with that. The warriors in this universe provide a unique challenge on top of the already difficult decisions. It's because in every region, the fantasy of Get a, a warrior is represented by something else. In Demacia, it is the Dauntless Vanguard. These are the classic knights in shiny armor pursuing justice. In Noxus, the traditional warrior would be part of the Trifarian Legion, which is a rank you can achieve after Animists. killing your best yeah, sparring right. friend in combat. These guys rarely use shields. In Shurima, the classic warrior is the warrior of the Golden Army. These are fighting for the glory of the Shuriman Emperor. In Piltover, you would have the Enforcers. Simply said, it's the cops. People will know these from Arcane. But in a way, the Wardens are the melee warriors of Piltover. But then, in the Freljord, warriors are represented by the Berserks, either wielding axes or giant blades as they worship the primal god known as the Iron Boar. On Targon, we have the Warriors of Rakor, which are somewhat themed after the classic Spartan armies. Then, in Ionia, the classic warrior is known as a Blademaster, with samurai-styled swords that have a rich history in this region. Also, there are the Vuju Blademasters, which are on a totally different level. 
The Voodoo technique is so powerful it was forbidden from using it in combat. The TLDR version of the story is that when Noxus invaded Ionia, Master Yi obliterated entire Noxian legions on his own. Before Noxians realized how overpowered he was and they nuked the town where the Vuju Blade Masters were trained. <laughs> so now there is no more Vuju Blade Masters, just normal Blade Masters. And lastly, the common warrior in Bilgewater would be a brawler. You see, I Good just named eight different kinds of warriors. How is Riot going to handle this? I don't know. They could just make one warrior class and then just have the players play out the fantasy while wearing cool armor sets. Or they could make it so that every origin has a different skin of the class. You know, all the abilities would be the same, they would be doing the same numbers. But when a Noxian swings a weapon, there is a bloody trail. And when an Iceborne Berserk swings a weapon, there is a frosty effect. But again, this is for Riot to figure out. Now I'm just going to show you all the unique and interesting classes from this universe. In Demacia we have the Mage Seekers, Demacia! these are the people who hunt down mages. They carry with them a stone disc called the Grey Mark. This is the tool that allows them to absorb magic. So this would be sort of an anti-magic class. There are also a lot of iconic Demacian scouts. Also, Demacia has a lot of stories about theaters and bards. But Demacia also brought spotlight onto the Sentinels. The Sentinels of Light are people dedicated to fighting the undead. Because the undead can't really be killed with normal weapons, they use the relic stones that can be forged into any weapon. Be it a crossbow, a gun, a really big gun, or even a sword. Fun fact, in the lore, the Sentinel guns don't have triggers you have to will it to fire with every fiber of your body. So of course, Lucian canonically fired it with his PP. <coughs> Lastly, this will be unknown to even veteran League players, but Demacia put a really cool twist onto the Paladin class. You see, in League of Legends, Kay. when you play as Garen, his ultimate see. is to smite his enemies right. with a giant holy blade. This made people wonder, is Garen a mage? In Demacia? Actually, no. In the lore, Garen has never done anything even similar to this. And that's because there is something even cooler happening. Most people in Demacia pray to the aspect of justice, which they call the Winged Protector. That's why Demacia has a lot of angelic statues. Coincidentally, the aspect of justice can also be found in League. It's scale. So what's happening is that when Garen is casting his ultimate, it is not him magically creating a holy blade in the sky. It is actually the aspect of justice it's answering his call. So even though this universe oh, doesn't yeah. really have a paladin class, which would be casting holy spells, this would be a really cool alternative. People who See, this, what was, this is exactly what I was talking about. Like, is Garen a paladin or a warrior? Their goals. That's what, exactly what I was Pretty talking cool, about. But now let's move on to Noxus. Noxians are I always considered Garen to be a paladin. Who harvest black powder. So they also have their own mercenaries with functional just a guns. Giga Chad? True. In Noxus, you can also find a lot of demonic cultists. So I would expect a warlock or a demon summoner. And they also have a few renowned assassin guilds. And the most unique of them all, Noxus also has a circle of hemomancers, people who follow Vladimir, a lord who used to be a hostage to the Darkin, and who eventually learned how to use their blood magic. So these people used the very same blood magic that shaped the Darkin. Then in Shurima, we may find Spagus, thank you for the four months. These people follow Praetorian, thank you for the 32 months. If Brock, thank you for the two months. Whose thank body you guys. has been reduced to nothing but arcane energy. I would honestly love to see this class in game, because I love the idea of having an Archon form on cooldown. Shurima also has some prophets who can open up tiny portals into the void and summon tiny void creatures. It would be sort of like Warlock in WoW. You know, use the power of the enemy against themselves. Then there are the Sand Shifters, people who can use the sand to create sand mirror images. And we can't forget about the Chronomancers, people who use time magic in a lot of creative, interesting ways. 
Then in Piltover, riding off of the success of Arcane, people will want to play as a Warden, which is a more elite version of the Enforcers. These would be equipped with sniper rifles and stun grenades. On the crafty side, there are also the Hextech Engineers. These are the people who can use science to allow them to wield magic even if they are not mages. And separate from them, there are also the Artificers. To them, anything from a powerful arm to blade legs should be possible. And down in Zone, I would love to see some kind of an alchemist, who's using questionable drugs to help his allies. Next we go into the Freljord. Here we can find the Draklorn Inquisitors, which are Lysandra's followers with abilities themed around true ice. Essentially, these would be Frost Battle Mages. But perhaps the most iconic for the Freljord would be the Shamans. These worship the animalistic primal gods of the Freljord. And like all their abilities mimic the primal gods. Be it a bear, a fox, a mammoth or a boar. Then on Targorn we would find a lot of people with celestial powers. You know, calling down stars and such. But there are also the Solari who use the power of the sun to enhance their attacks. They also wear massive plated armor, so this would be the tank class. Or the Lunari, who use the power of the moon to stay in the shadows. This would be more of an assassin class. Besides these, there are also a lot of star callers around, and even draconic worshippers. Then in Ionia, besides the Vuju Blademasters, which would be far too overpowered, some people choose to fight without a blade. These would be the monks of Hirana. They channel the power of Ionian dragons to empower their limbs. And don't worry, they are a bit different from the traditional monks. They are far more badass. Dude, Lee Sin players are so annoying, dude. Every Lee Sin player thinks they're like a god. When you're playing League of Legends, when Lee Sin is on the opposing team, they're always trying to like... like it, it, it's, it's this like crazy like overconfidence and it's so like annoying and arrogant. They, they throw their ball and they kick to it and then they jump back for no reason. Like, look how skilled I am. But they're really, they're just like pressing two buttons, right? But they go and every time I feel like I'm playing against a Lee, uh, a Lee Sin, it's just like they're flying over the walls, like boom, ult, kick somebody out from under the tower, boom, gank, whatever, fly back, throw down a, throw down a totem or uh, throw down a ward, jump to the ward, whatever. But then whenever I have a Lee Sin on my team, I just feel like the Lee Sin on my team just goes and finds a way to just like launch himself into towers. He's like two towers deep into the Nexus. Like, I, I don't know what it is with Lee Sin players. It's it's one or the other. There's never like an, a, a, an okay Lee Sin. Ever. It's they're either like gods or they're just co completely throwing the game at every hour. They're like trying to get themselves killed every single second of the game. It's insane, dude. Ionia is also home to the Kinku Ninjas. Their goal is to maintain... Yeah, so players are the same, dude. It's, it's either, like, insane or just complete dog people, shit. The ninjas go out and deal with the spirit. And yeah, so is the new Lee Sin. terrorizing the spirits, the ninjas go out and deal with the people. Most of these are your classic ninjas empowered with spiritual magic. But some are using the forbidden shadow technique. And while they surely look evil, just like anything in League of Legends, it's not really one-sided. These ninjas are simply using questionable techniques to protect their homeland. And honestly, the shadow ninjas are so iconic for Ionia, I really do believe they will be playable. Then we get to Bilgewater. Besides all the things that you could do with pirates and monster hunters, the most iconic class of this place are the priests of Buru. The Buru worship the god of motion called Nagake Boros. While they are priests, they fight with full physical strength, while borrowing power from the god to empower themselves. Usually this means the god spawns tentacles to smack the enemies around. But they also have healing powers, so that would be a really cool support class. In Riot's RPG called Ruined King, you can play as Ilawi the High Priestess of Nagake Boros. Dude, I hate and Illawai. there you can see all the attacks she is can Is it Illawai, Illawai? I hate, I hate. Us to the dude, last laning place. against that is so Ishtar, obnoxious. which will most likely be saved for an expansion. As I mentioned in the last video, Ishtal specializes in only one thing. Elemental magic. 
So if elemental mages become a class, and they should, even in League elemental dragons are a core mechanic. They would come from Ishtal. But that's it for all the unique classes this universe has to offer. Funny Dude, I really want to play League now, frick. All these classes, I really want to play League now. A lot of them fall under specific We're going to play Madden today. We already so talked about Madden. So going with the skin idea for all the classes wouldn't be too unreasonable. But developing so many artistic variations of the classes would be taxing. So overall, I believe Riot should not care about disappointing some players for not including their favorite class. With so many options, it's going to happen anyway. Instead, pick a couple of classes that simply make sense for you. You know, a Blade Master here, an Arcane Mage there, and just have fun. Having fun during development usually translates into great experiences. And I hope I'm not pressuring anyone by stirring up hype. If anything, I'm just happy Twitch that Prime. people find these videos interesting. And all I'm doing is presenting information that Riot released over the past the 19 years. months. I mean, I know the video is interesting because Asmon only paused three times and he said, That's fucking cool. And I like it a lot. And that's what the fuck? This is actually really cool. <laughs> dude, response one of four. Response, dude, two out of four. That to me marks a big success. <laughs> Next time, we are going to talk about all the already established raid bosses of this universe, which is a very personal topic for me. You know, I am a father, my son is two years old, so by the time this MMO comes out, he's going to be just the right age to heal my raids. <laughs> Farm you gold. Dude, I'm excited, man. I'm excited about this Riot MMO. I mean, I'm not, uh, I'm not too excited because I know it's gonna be a long time till it comes out. But um, I do. Uh, like you guys know me, I, I played League for a lot of years. I, I played League of Legends for a lot of years. I, uh, I still occasionally, uh, you know, ha have deep dark thoughts, and I decide to play League of Legends. Um, so I, I'm, I'm definitely a, a fan of of what I think Riot can do with an MMO. And uh, these these videos are really good. Uh, Necrit's videos are, are, are actually phenomenal. Uh, these these two videos that we've watched, and um, I think they do a really good job of, of kind of like breaking down the the potential. It's all speculation, right? But but they do a good job of breaking down the uh, potential for what these games could have to offer. So super cool. I'm very excited. Uh, very excited about this new Riot MMO. Um, it's gonna come out in like ten years, but. You know, we'll, we'll always be we'll always be looking at new games and everything, not not just MMOs, but uh, especially with MMOs, you guys know it's it's always gonna have like a very like nice like it's gonna be very dear to my heart. MMOs will always be dear to my heart. So uh, if you guys enjoyed the video, make sure to subscribe, hit the bell so you guys get notifications on my videos. My YouTube channel is like super scuffed for some reason. My videos won't show up in your recommended, or or um, you might not even get notifications. So make sure you hit. All notifications I do everything on this YouTube channel and uh, we've got a lot of games coming up a lot of fun stuff check out my stream twitch.tv slash svan TV uh, YouTube is svan TV discord Instagram reddit Twitter everything is svan TV uh, check out all that stuff and uh, thanks for watching we'll see you guys next time